my thoughts were spurred by Brother Ricky from last week, his um, meditation he had when he spoke about Jesus appearing to his disciples after he had risen from the dead and caused them to make a great catch of fish. And I began to consider the differences in the disciples' reactions, and particularly Peter's, between the two different occasions this happened. Because remember, he made this a great catch of fish happen twice. These accounts are found in Luke 5 and also John 21. And I understand that each of these accounts provide their own types and lessons that we can learn. Um, but as I considered them together and I compared the two, I noticed there was an overall advancement made by the disciples in the second account. So I wanted to go through some comparisons between the two and see um, where Jesus caused this advancement in this great um, catch of fish. Now the first one was done at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And the second one was done after his, resurrec after his resurrection. So um, in, in, in both occasions, though, they were out all night, the night before, and caught nothing. In both occasions, Jesus gave the command that they cast out or let down the net. And in both occasions, they caught a multitude of fish. So I wanted to look first in um, Luke 5, verses 4 and 5. It says, now when he had left speaking, he, had, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. So the first thing I wanted to note here was Peter's response to this command. There's a response both times. <laughs> the first time, Peter answers back. And, and we did this this morning. I'm not getting on Peter's case here either. <laughs> um, but we remember this is toward the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And Peter isn't as familiar with Jesus at this point as what he would be later. His response indicates he's really not sure what to, what to expect at this point. But he will comply since it was the Lord that told him to do so. And that is that kind of response is one that the Lord can work with. I saw this as like when we all first come into the kingdom. We do know who Jesus is. We do know that he is the son of God and that he died to take away our sin. But that's about the extent of what we know when we first come in. We come in as babes. That's the nature of our new birth. So we're somewhat limited in our fellowship that we can have with the Lord. Um, our acquaintance isn't as familiar as what it will be as we continue in him just due to the fact we haven't had time to mature and to grow up into Christ. Uh -huh. So we do have an initial fe fellowship, but it deepens as our knowledge of him broadens. Amen. So P so Peter answers back this first time. Now the second time in 21, John 21, 6, I'm going to be flipping back and forth. He s says, um, and he said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship, and you shall find. They cast, therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. So the second time, Peter doesn't even know yet that it's Jesus giving the command. But he doesn't answer back. He just immediately gets right to work. He casts the net right in. The second thing I wanted to see was, in, um, the, was the actual nets. In the account of Luke 6 and 7, verses 6 and 7, it says, And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships, so that they began to sink. And again, so their, their net broke, and they needed help from another ship, so that they wouldn't lose any fish. Again, I saw this as like a picture of newer faith, not necessarily weak faith or little faith due to, the, due to a lack of interest in the things of God, but faith that hasn't been confirmed yet. There's the, no shame in this beginning faith because if nurtured, it will grow. 
But the Lord provides such an abundance for his children. And like as he did right here with the catch of fish. But when we are young in faith, mm -hmm. we need help yeah. to gather it all in. It's like our nets aren't strong enough on their own to contain all the Lord is providing. So our brethren, they come alongside us and they help us so that we don't lose anything. Yeah. And also when this happens, the catch is shared between the two vessels. So in the end, everyone benefits from the catch. Amen. In John's account, or in the count of John, in uh, verse 11, it says, Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, 150 and three, and for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. So the net did not break in this one. So we can see what I wanted to look at here is the, this advancement between the two. This time it did not break. And I got a picture of, of the strong, well-seasoned faith. This is the kind of faith that is able to hold whatever the Lord um, dishes out, so to speak. Amen. But it's still only by the grace of God that we're able to contain it. Mm -hmm. See, ordinarily, we can rightly assume that the net would have broken or else the spirit would not have made note that the net did not break, yeah. even with so many fish. Yeah. Ordinarily, mankind is not able to contain divinity uh -huh. living within himself. Mm -hmm. But God works in the extraordinary things like placing a treasure in an earthen vessel. Mm -hmm. And like the Father and the Son making their abode within our hearts even while we are in the earth. Amen. Mm -hmm. By His grace, He makes us a suitable vessel that is able to contain the knowledge of God without being broken. Amen. Uh -huh. All saints collectively are being builded together mm -hmm. to be a habitation of God, and this building will be so complete and satisfactory to God that He will be able to reside in it without the building suffering loss or breaking apart at his holy presence. Um, moving on to verse 8 in Luke. This is Peter's immediate response to this. It says, When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. I remember Brother Given saying years ago, and it stuck with me, that our initial introduction with the Lord is met with some unpleasantness as we are faced with the truth that we are filthy sinners and enemies of a holy and righteous God. Because of Christ being the light that he is, though, Peter is able to rightly discern who he really was. And we spoke about this, too, a little bit this morning. This wasn't, Peter wasn't in gross immorality. This was Peter, the Lord chose him to be an apostle because he was upright and, and devout. But all man has this sinful nature that has to be, dealt with and this can only be properly discerned while in the presence of Jesus we can now take heart knowing that in his light we see light and he is illuminating us that we can be changed from glory to glory being confirmed being conformed into the image of Christ but that hadn't been revealed to Peter yet so his response was what any honest heart would say with that amount of knowledge yeah. at the time. He says, depart from me. But then, let's look at the progression again in John 21, 7. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved saith to Peter, it is the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his father's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. So now, <laughs> Peter jumps off the boat to get yeah. to Jesus as fast as he possibly could. Amen. So no more would he be departed from his Lord. Uh -huh. He had spent considerable time with Jesus. Yeah. He knew who Jesus was. Yeah. He was the first to confess that Jesus yeah. is the Christ, the Son yeah. of the living God. His love for Jesus had so deepened that he was even willing to die for his Lord, which he eventually did do. Mm -hmm. Even after Peter while being sifted by Satan, denied him, and straightway bitterly wept over it. As soon as Peter knew it was Jesus, he didn't hesitate one second, but with haste he drew near to the Lord. 
He didn't even wait for the boat. He just wanted to get to him as quick as he could. James 4a says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh unto you. These two, these are two very different responses um, that these are two very different responses to the great catch of fish. A major change had taken place between these two events that caused it. So what happened for such advancement to be made? Jesus overcame the world by, the death on, by his death on the cross and was resurrected. Just as the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom, the way between mankind and God had been opened up through Jesus Christ. Jesus had not yet ascended to heaven at this point, and the Holy Spirit had not yet come, but Peter's quickness to beat a path to the Lord was a first fruit to the work that Christ had accomplished on the cross and to what was soon coming. The longer we remain in the Lord, the more our desire for him grows. When we assemble together in the name of the Lord and we perceive he is among us, our hearts constrain us that we like peter dive right into the water to get close to him as fast as we can Amen. i'm thankful that our meetings in our meetings we have an environment that when we do come together we do delve right into the word of god but we don't have time for what is called time fillers we don't waste time doing that we just get to the lord amen uh, Luke, again, in verse 9, says, For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes that they had taken. This ast- they were astonished or dumbfounded. They were so amazed by this great catch of fish, they didn't know what to do with it all. They couldn't readily process what had taken place and come to a right conclusion. There was a lack of understanding that left them wanting. And this, this astonishment is not a good thing. This astonishment is what caused Peter to say, depart from me. Mm-hmm. Astonishment leaves a person without hope. We are all growing in this area, but we want to be so familiar with God that when he works, we aren't surprised by it. Mm-hmm but rather can first recognize his hand in the work, glory in it, understand it and grasp it, that what he is actually working in, and then to intelligently offer back praise to God as a worthy response to the work that he did do. So now contrast that, this astonishment, with um, verse 12 in John. It says, Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine, and none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. So again, we see advancement. They're not Mm -hmm. astonished anymore. They know it is the Lord. Peter went from being astonished and in a state of hopelessness to casting himself into the sea to get to the Lord as quick as he could, knowing it was the Lord. Spending time with Jesus will yield good fruit. You will never be left hopeless after spending time in his presence. He enlightens the heart. He does not confuse it. He gives hope. He does not take it. He reveals truth. He does not obscure it to his people. These men weren't stumped or surprised here. They made the connection and recognized the Lord by his words and by his works. Our faith is what enables us to know what we know and that we know it. It's the substance of things we hope for and our evidence of things that we can't see. Now, in both of these accounts, Jesus speaks each time after a catch. Um, And we want to give ear to what the Lord says after he works. So Luke account in verses 10 and 11 says, And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not. From henceforth thou shalt catch men. And they had, and when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. So Jesus gives them words of comfort and with them a promise of what he was going to make them be. We can see the gentleness of the Savior, 
by using something they were already familiar with, being fishermen, to manifest to them what they would become. Jesus was demonstrating that just as he can cause a great catch of fish, he can also save a multitude of men. And he would be doing it through his disciples. The disciples let down their nets into the world for a draught, and we are part of this ultimate great catch that's going to be taken in. And it was after this catch that they forsook all and followed Jesus. This event helped to confirm their faith to them. No more would they toil unproductively and in vain. Now they would spend themselves to work unto God as servants of the Most High, having their labors undergirded by the grace of God, which no man can thwart. This is still the requirement today for following Jesus, and it is worth it. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. Mark 8:35. We confess now that we have already forsaken the world in our hearts, so that in the end we may win Christ. Amen. Back to John's account, um, 10 through 13. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. And Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, and hundred and fifty and three, for there were so many, yet was not the net broken. And Jesus said unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? And Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. So what I saw here was Jesus... Um, wants to share in the joy that we experience when he does a work and we recognize it, it was the Lord. We take great delight in the Lord Jesus working in us, and he still bids us now that we bring some of what we caught as a result of his goodness to us. May we always be as eager as Peter was when he ran back to the boat to gather up the spoil to present to the Lord. When the Lord returns, we are going to sit down at his table and dine with Jesus, and he will give us some of what he has already prepared. Luke twelve thirty seven says, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he findeth watching, verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. This is the kind of fellowship that satisfies the soul. So again, we see advancement made between the two. The first, they forsook all to follow Jesus. And the second, they came with more understanding and are able to contribute to the meal that Jesus prepared as they had fellowship one with another. One last um, quick comparison is this location of when this happened. In the first account, he says, launch out into the deep. And I also wanted to look at Jesus' proximity to the disciples. Um, Launch out into the deep. I don't know if land was in sight or not, but I do know to go to the deep, you have to leave the shore. And so there's, there's, your safety is compromised. Jesus is there with them in the boat the entire time, though. And while, while we're in the world, Jesus is with us. He promised he will not forsake us. He can take us away from the shore and out of places of comfort and maybe even to an environment that would be potentially dangerous. But he will supply in abundance as we trust him. Sometimes we need to be out in the deep in order to see Jesus at work. But in the account in John, it says they were not far from land. Uh, I wanted to read it. It's, it's, a, it's an A. It says the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as were 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. So Jesus, he's not even in the boat with them. He's on the shore, and he calls to them, asked them if they caught anything. And um, so tracking with this theme of progression, I can see that we're, it's as if we're almost at the shoreline of glory. The pearly gates are not far off, maybe 200 cubits. We'll be near the shores of glory, and Jesus will call out to us. We will be given abundant entrance into the kingdom, Amen. and we too will bring some of what we caught. Amen. 
knowing it was he that gave the increase. Amen. Amen. Progression and advancement encourages the saints. Mm-hmm. And that's why I wanted to, to share these things with, with you all tonight. Um, onward and upward is the manner of the kingdom because it's forcefully advancing. So when we read these accounts, we glory in seeing the growth and the progress that took place in the apostles between what was one of Jesus' earliest miracles to the very last moments they would see Jesus on the earth. They did advance to the fullest measure of their ability that they could attain to at the time. Mm -hmm. After Jesus' ascension and he sent the Spirit, they advanced farther. Jesus truly is our Savior, and he is effective at his work. He has provided... We can take heart when we remember how he worked among the saints in the record he has provided. And we can be confident that he will cause us also to make good progress that is pleasing to him. So knowing that, we can be diligent also to fill up the measure of our faith. Because he will make us ready for the judgment. Mm -hmm. Philippians 1.6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's pray as we open our meeting. Our dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this record of the things that um, you have done in your people. We thank you, Father, that we can see um, where you have worked and that you are able to bring your people along, that Jesus opened up the way, that we um, can continue in that way. We pray, Father, tonight as... um, as we have gathered together to learn of you, that you would minister to our hearts, that you would give us grace, that we would be able to contain the things that you um, have for us. We want, Father, for our nets to be strong so that they can hold what you have for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.